Morning, Sarit. Morning, Trevor. Um, at the heart of what you're reporting on are a number of cases, including the one at Batley Grammar School, after which a teacher went into hiding. What, what, what did you find in your investigation? So my review is an examination of some of the contemporary threats to social cohesion and democratic resilience in our country. And there's a whole range of different threats I, I outline in my review. One of them is what I termed freedom restricting harassment, which is where individuals experience or witness threatening, intimidatory or abusive behaviour, um, which is then leading people to self-censor out of fear. Um, to themselves. So it's really concerning. And one of the examples I highlight is that case of the Batley RS teacher who, of course, went into hiding about three years ago. Um, and it's a, it's a shocking example. It still shocks me today that in our democracy in this day and age, the fact that a teacher, just in the course of his duty, was forced into hiding because of his activity, because he was delivering a legitimate educational lesson with no malicious in intent. And one of the reasons why I wanted to look at that case study was to understand why. Why was it he felt he had to go into hiding? I wanted to assess what was the response of the agencies? Did he, they give him the help he needed? And it, it is a very devastating case. In his particular case, it was uh, about the fact that in the course of his lesson, he showed uh, images of the Prophet Muhammad and some parents uh, objected to this and then there were demonstrations outside the school and all the other stuff followed. But it's not just about Islam, is it? No, of course not. I mean, in this particular case, you're right, there was an independent investigation that actually looked at what he had taught and they said that it was purely for educational purposes. Um, and he actually used the image of the Prophet Muhammad for that reason. It was a lesson about blasphemy and offence and how do we, as a diverse democracy, deal with offence? Um, and that's what the lesson was about. And, of course, some of those protesters decided to engage in threatening and intimidatory behaviour. And, of course, we have to remember there were a lot of Muslims who absolutely supported the teacher. They did not support the protests and they were very much in support of him. And what my review is going to show is it's really inaccurate, I have to say, to suggest that the issue of um, freedom-restricting harassment or extremism or all these other divisions that we're seeing in our society is being somehow only... Uh, is only a problem for coming from Muslim communities. It is a much more broader problem, whether we're talking about Sikh fundamentalism, far-right extremism, and also then activity. We don't know who's responsible for uh, delivering on it. So it, it's a, a much more broader problem in our society. One of the points that, that, that I think you raise is this, this issue of self-censorship. But a, a lot of uh, these... Uh, incidents don't ever get to the point of uh, demonstrations and public conflict because people just go, oh, I don't want to deal with this. How, how serious do you think this that problem is? One of the th things that my report's going to show tomorrow is this idea of freedom restricting harassment. And you know, Trevor, that over the last couple of years, but particularly in the last couple of months, the focus has been how members of parliament and those in public life have been at the forefront of experiencing this level of harassment and censorship. What my report is going to show for the first time is that this is a much wider problem in our society, which is affecting people from all walks of life. So I'm talking about counsellors, journalists, teachers and academics, those working in the arts and cultural sector who are experiencing severe levels of harassment and abuse, which is then resulting in them self-censoring. We did a poll, a full poll of the first kind, which shows to the extent the public experiencing freedom restricting harassment. So, for example, over three quarters of the public have refrained from expressing their personal opinion in public because of fear that they will receive freedom restricting harassment. Nearly half of the public have witnessed others experiencing freedom restricting harassment, which has then resulted in them self-censoring as well. I'm just showing you the chilling impact. And 27% of the public having experienced life-altering consequences of freedom restricting harassment have had to change substantially the way they live their lives. This includes, for example, taking additional security measures, changing house, um, having to leave their jobs. That is devastating and the public are unsurprisingly very worried about this. So again, what our polling showed was that around seven in ten of the public believe that it is having a severe impact on their ability to live freely in our country. It's censoring the way they live their personal and professional lives. But the public are also concerned that it is undermining our ability to live well together as a society and it will deter people from contributing to public life in the future. And I think that's a damning indictment of the state of harassment and censorship in our country. And as a society, if we care about protecting those democratic rights and freedoms that are so central to us as a nation, 
my call to the government is we have to do far more to tackle this threat, which is undermining academic freedom, press freedom, the arts and cultural sector, um, and civic society even. It poses a serious threat to our democratic way of life. Well, in fact, the, the, the second part of your uh, title, as it were, refers to democratic resilience. And uh, from what you're saying, it seems that um, one key part of this is that people don't feel that they can express. And, uh, that, you know, people joke about, you know, people saying, you can't say this, say that. But it sounds like that's actually a reality rather than just a throwaway line. I think it's even worse than that, because what my report's going to show is, is that if people are choosing to not express a legitimate opinion, no matter how offensive it is, but they're not um, expressing that opinion because of fear of receiving threatening, intimidatory, abusive harassment, that is a different thing. And, I mean, the reality is, Trevor, is that there are all kinds of different forms of censorship. There is everyday harmless censorship, which to a degree we all kind of engage in. You know, there are things that we don't speak about because for, for very normal reasons, maybe we don't know enough about a topic. Um, but that's very different to harmful levels of censorship, which is where I think freedom restricting harassment falls under, where if you are being forced to self-censor or you're being forced not to exercise your democratic rights and freedoms because you're experiencing threatening, intimidatory and abusive harassment, that is very, very different, and in my view, yeah. that, is, that is serious that we have to address. What, what do you want the government to do about it? With, uh, because once you get government into this sphere, isn't there a risk that actually uh, we're now talking about suppressing people's freedom of expression? Because in the end, people can say you know, what they, they like, but bans and government action should surely be reserved for actions. So this, this is not about banning. I mean, let's be absolutely clear that because this freedom-restricting harassment that people are experiencing is directly leading to people uh, being unable to express their views. It's creating a chilling impact on freedom of expression. So it's a kind of circular problem where if you don't deal with it, it is already undermining freedom of expression in this country. My review will identify some of the actions and the recommendations that I've made to the government. This includes, for example, officially recognising this phenomenon of freedom-restricting harassment, doing far more to support victims of freedom-restricting harassment, like the Batley teacher, who was totally and utterly failed. He was not given any support. He was not recognised as a victim by the Victims Code, for example. He was not even recognised as a victim of crime, despite the completely life-altering experience he had to go through. I think that's unacceptable. And the, the fact that the scale of this is so significant is, in my view, something that the government has to has to, to deal with. So it's not about banning groups. It's about ensuring that, yes, are our laws robust enough? Are police looking at harassment cases more effectively? But also, this is about behaviours. It's about how do you and I, living in a diverse democracy, how do we respect our differences? No matter how much we may have different political opinions or views or beliefs, we have to be able to live together in a way that respects and, and recognises those differences in a plural democracy. Sarah Khan, report out tomorrow. Thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you very much.